Good to be here. Good to see some familiar faces. Um, we're going to open this up where you'll get me as the appetizer, and then we will turn it over to the main course, which will be Jill Rowland. So uh, I'm always in uh, awe of just the wide range of expertise and the wide range of people that Taylor Dudley knows. I mean, this topic comes up around child welfare. She is as well versed and as well informed as, as anybody I know. So anytime she asks me to participate and show up, I'm there because I want to be amongst the folks who are thinking about these issues, talking about these issues. So I want to spend just a little bit of my time today kind of helping to frame just a small piece of the work that I do, but then how uh, I see my work now really starting to broaden to look at these intersections between education and the, and, the, and the foster care system because I maintain that there are some things that we have to recognize that when schools don't serve young people adequately, the lifetime outcomes are not very positive. And so for us to look at sort of how we end up with a foster care system, why we end up with the foster care system, and to not look at the social determinants of health, issues of poverty, issues tied to mental health supports, issues tied to having affordable housing, uh, access to quality food, and access to a quality education are all factors that have an impact on who we end up seeing in these systems uh, down the line. And I would argue that in many ways, there are certain so-called risk factors that we could look at with young, we can look at with young people today, and we can almost begin to make predictive kinds of estimates about the likelihood that certain young people might find themselves in these various systems in the next five, 10, 15 years. Not because that there is something wrong, flawed, or, or inadequate about these young people and in their and their families. I think there are flaws in our systems and structures that are supposed to serve them. And I think we have to have a different kind of conversation when we start to understand that and one that is not centered on blaming and pointing the finger at families and children, but saying, how can our supports be better? How can our systems be better to really support our most vulnerable populations? Is there a way I can um, share my screen, uh, please, Taylor? I got a few slides I want to use to kind of help frame some of my comments before I pass it off to Jill. Uh, let me see. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So I want to, I want to, and again, I always, I always tell myself I'm thinking about these issues as I'm talking about these issues, and I'm not always at a place of fully understanding or comprehending them. So when and where possible, I'd love for you to all to, to just chime in or say I disagree or I don't see it that way or contribute in the chat. So what kind of brings me to this work is sort of this former life I had as a former, as a classroom teacher. And as a former classroom teacher in Compton, I was frustrated with the degrees to which I felt like the black and brown children who I taught and served were not being adequately supported. This is across the board. And so I spent the last two and a half decades looking at what are called, or what were called in the beginning, achievement gaps. Uh, now some have called them, you know, opportunity gaps. And really the, for those who are not as familiar with them, achievement and or opportunity gaps are ways we look at the sort of the, dis the disparate outcomes uh, of young people in our, in our country. And I'll just give you just one brief example of how that plays itself out. It's like with, with graduation rates. And so we look at graduation rates, we look at this based on a sort of disaggregated way of where we see certain groups being sort of situated. So something came out last August, the California Department of Education had a report saying that California had reached this highest level of high school graduation ever. And it was a milestone because the graduation rates for our state were close to about 84%. We've never had graduation rates that high. So there's a lot of big accomplishments and recognition and accolades that were being given to educators across the country. And, and you know, understandably so, educators are, are hardworking people dedicated to their craft and to their trade. But what the report did not really delve into as much as something my grandmother used to always tell my, my, my brother and I and my cousins that the devil is always in the details. And what the CDE did not shed light on was these factors that you see before you, that when you begin to peel back some of the layers and look at specific subgroups, you see different levels of completion of high school. And I raised high school graduation as one particular area because what we know from the research is that for young people in this state, and particularly in Southern California, Los Angeles County, failure to graduate from high school uh, leads to a significant number of risk factors for anybody. Uh, for young people who don't have a high school diploma or a high school equivalent, there's increased likelihood for experiencing uh, homelessness, increased likelihood for experiencing um, incarceration. Uh, and we know that there's also now some data that suggests that for people who don't graduate from high school, 
that if and when they have children, there's an increased likelihood that those children will end up in various systems across our state. So high school is a, is a, is a really important threshold because if you can get young people to at least graduate with a high school diploma, the overall life qualities, life chances, the supports, the services, the, the ways in which uh, people are able, able to navigate their worlds are, are fundamentally different just with a high school uh, education. So when you look at these data here, it points to a really daunting picture, one that, that I've tried to spend a lot of my professional career trying to understand, issues tied to where are the gaps? Who are the gaps being most, uh, so who, who's being most harmed by the gaps? And why do we have the gaps? So if you just look at here in our state of California graduation rates, which were again celebrated for 1920 all time high, you notice that there's some subgroups that don't do quite well as others. Uh, namely, you see African-American uh, males, you see uh, indigenous males and you see Latinx males are not at the levels that we would like for them to be. We also see that there are some gender discrepancies here that, that across the board, girls are performing at a higher level than, than boys, which is another conversation we should be having. Uh, and you begin to look at the fact that white students, Asian students, et cetera, do better. And so I'm not gonna delve into all the explanations as to why this happens, but I think it at least begs some, some, some conversation around sort of why these gaps remain and why these gaps are in place. And I think you know, it, would be, it would be not too easy to come to the conclusion that the very groups who, who have the lower rates of graduation uh, are the groups who have historically in this country been excluded, uh, are the groups who historically in this country have uh, been subjected to either slavery and or Jim, Clow, or Jim, Jim Crow, have been subjected to uh, removing and stolen lands, colonization, et cetera, et cetera. So when you look at the three groups who, are, who have the lowest outcomes, you have to look at the historical context there, which explains a lot. And I share that because when I oftentimes share these data with educators, I'm oftentimes really deeply troubled by the way in which when I ask educators to share what they think are explanations for these data, oftentimes it's a quick reverting to their parents don't value education as much, or the students aren't as motivated or the students don't have the necessary grit to do better in school. So there's oftentimes what is referred to as victim blaming. And I wanna hope that we can move away from that because I raise this because there's a set of consequences for these students who don't re reach that graduation threshold, as I mentioned, which then has started to lead me to understand, okay, what happens to some of these young people? And like I said, I've got a student, Earl Edwards, who does phenomenal work on homelessness. And he shows this almost correlation that exists between levels of education that people have and likelihood of ending up being a uh, houselessness, um, in, in houseless. Uh, same thing around incarceration. But I think what we're now learning that there's also some connections that we can make for these young people who become adults and who have children and their likelihood to end up in care. So then I kind of jump and fast forward to ask this question about does bias exist in the child welfare system? Because what we're seeing here in Los Angeles County, and I think you talked about it when David Noble was here, is that there's some disturbing data that shows that black youth in particular are in the, child welfare, in the child welfare system at disproportionately higher rates than, than other groups. Uh, and to me, that begs a question about what is going on and, and why is this happening? I raise this in light of the fact that what we know is that um, most children who have open cases in DCFS, uh, those open cases are a result of calls that have come into the um, DCFS hotline. Uh, we learned about a year and a half or so ago when we went to the uh, to the to DCF, DCFS hotline that the majority of calls that come into the hotline come from educators, uh, classroom teachers, principals, school personnel. Uh, that probably is not a surprise to many people because school personnel see and interact with young people more throughout the course of a day than probably any other group of uh, individuals outside of their parents. So teachers see uh, children on a day in day out basis, even during the pandemic with remote learning, it was still an opportunity to see young people at least virtually. But part of what we are also learning now is that there's been some work done by the Casey Foundation has shown that though educators, teachers in particular, have the highest rates of reporting children to child welfare for a suspicion of abuse and neglect, that overwhelmingly what they report children for does not result in open cases. So what happens is that teachers are obviously seeing something that they think rises to the level of abuse or neglect, uh, 
And then as mandated reporters, I know when I was a classroom teacher, I was taught if you see something, suspect something, say something, right? Mandated reporters, you have to make sure that you are not letting something that you see that could be deeply concerning go uninvestigated. We're always told it's not your role to investigate, but it's your role to report. But the question becomes, how do people sort of biases sort of play out in the ways in which they see certain kinds of behaviors or the way that they see certain living conditions? Or the, or the way that they see people who parent in particular ways. And I raise that because again, when you look at some of the outcomes that I just showed you a moment ago, uh, one of the, explana uh, one of the, the exp uh, expl explanatory variables is the fact that we know that many young people who don't do well in school is a byproduct of lower expectations. But we don't have the same kind of expectation for black, brown, bilingual, poor students as we have for others. We sort of buy into certain stereotypes and certain kinds of negative depictions of them when it comes to their educational prospects. So the question we have to ask is, does the same thing exist in the child welfare system? Do we look at black and brown families and black and brown children with a different lens than we see, let's say white children and white families? Because we see here in LA County that the numbers are about black youth making up close to seven, eight percent of the children in LA County but almost close to 30% of the young people who are in child, who are in foster care in our county. So again, 7% in the county compared to 30% in foster care are black. So that raises some, some questions about, you know, does race matter? If so, how does it matter? Why does it matter? There are folks out there who would push back on that notion and say, that's not what this is about. It's not about race, it's about abuse and neglect. Uh, one would suggest that, you know, well, how do you have such widespread disproportionality? So I would make the statement and I would say that child welfare is not exempt from structural racism and implicit bias. Um, and I, I, I would reinforce the statement that Professor Jessica Price has made, and, and I'll talk about her in a moment, because Jessica Price has been one of the four at the forefront of beginning to raise this question about implicit bias, um, about racism. But really, Jessica Price was, was, is, 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 is raising these issues around bias. But if you look at the work of Dorothy Strickland, she raised this issue uh, over two decades ago when she talked about the fact that Black families were being incarcerated and, 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 and Black families were being placed in foster care for some of the most um, inexplicable reasons. Uh, that issues of poverty, which should not result in children being detained, was used as a reason to, to detain Black children. Um, certain disciplinary practices that did not rise to the level of abuse were being used as a reason to, to detain Black children. So part of what I would contend is that child welfare, again, is not exempt from structural racism and implicit bias, which means that there's a set of conversations we need to have about what that means and what that looks like in the context of the needs that young people who care have when it comes to the educational supports. So if you look at this, I think what's tied to this is this idea that there are, are there normative standards of what good parenting looks like? And I think you all have been having these conversations about what good parenting looks like, because whether or not we like to admit it, all of us probably have these really preconceived notions of what good parenting looks like. Uh, in many instances, when I ask this question to teachers, teachers oftentimes say things, yes, good parenting means two-parent household. Okay, let's stop there. First and foremost, why does two-parent household come to mind of what good parenting looks like? There's no data to suggest that two-parenting, that two-parent households are better in terms of support, love, care, and attention than single parent households. Uh, I would go one step further and say, it's not the, not the, it's not the household uh, composition that matters most, it's the household disposition that matters. You can show me a single parent household that's full of love, care, support, and that's highly functional. You can also show me a, 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 a two parent household that's highly dysfunctional. So this idea of what good parenting looks like is sort of based on some what are narratives that typically are steeped in middle class, white, heteronormative sort of values, right? This idea that somehow if you have, you know, you have to have a mom and a dad. Again, the data does not bear out that having individuals who are, who are heterosexual couples that they are somehow able to provide a more loving, caring, supportive household than same-sex couples could look like. So again, part of what we have to start doing is pushing back against these normative standards of what good parenting is on what ideal household structures are, because then this ties into issues of abuse and neglect. Because if we have this narrative shaped around what we think families should look like, what care and support and love looks like, if we don't think about how we train teachers, people in law enforcement, people in the medical field, but I stay with education here because that's where the majority of our calls are coming from, then if we're not challenging these notions of good parenting, supportive parenting, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of not allowing us to begin to understand why we see these gaps in, in when it comes to educational opportunity 
and why we see this disproportionality when it comes to youth and care. So with that as a backdrop, part of what we have to recognize is again, we have to ask why do more LA County black children end up in foster care? And experts have been debating this for the last decade or so. When you look at the data here and you see that black youth and uh, indigenous youth have higher rates than anybody else, uh, which should be begging the question, why, 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 right? And again, we cannot divorce this from what we see with the outcomes I showed you at the outset. But I would frame this around the idea that when it comes to education, much like when it comes to issues tied to child welfare, that race matters. Uh, as much as we try to move towards a colorblind approach in education, I think we cannot negate the fact that the history of racism and exclusion is, is real. And if we think that the remnants are not still with us here today in 2021, we would be really fooling ourselves. So we have to raise the question. And part of what is important about that is that now recently, and I'm not sure if Taylor shared with you, but just as recently as last week, Taylor has really led our efforts in the Pritzker Center um, to look at you know, this very issue again of why black children being removed from homes at such, a, at such a high rate and the plans to engage in a blind removal pilot. Uh, and so what I find to be interesting is that in the education field, we really somewhat challenge or I challenge and many folks challenge the idea of colorblindness by saying that it's more detrimental than we recognize. But, but there are folks in the child welfare, world, well, child welfare world who are saying, well, wait a minute, maybe there could be some potential benefits to looking at a colorblind approach to how kids end up in care. So just to give you some background, and again, if I'm being repetitive here, please let me know because I'm not, I don't know if Taylor shared any of this with you, but part of what we want to do is really try to build on some of the work of Jessica Price, where she has talked about blind removal. So have you talked much about this at all, Taylor? I have not, Tyrone. Okay, okay. So I'll try to do it my best, but if I mess this up, jump in, Taylor. <laughs> so, so, so Jessica, Jessica, yeah, Jessica Price, Dr. Jessica Price said, look, she said, she looked at data in, in, in Nassau County, Florida, and in, uh, in the state of New York. And she said, what if, what if we looked at cases of children in care and we did not look at their race? What if the caseworker who went out, obviously the caseworker who would initially go out would know the race and ethnicity of the youth, but that caseworker has to come back and share his, her, or their findings with the team of folks to help inform those decisions. And what would happen if you did not know the individual family or child's race? Uh, in other words, a colorblind approach, blind removal. And what Jessica Price found in her work is that when they did this, that there was a significant decrease in the number of black children who were removed from their homes. Uh, the rate started at about 55%, went down to about 29%. They saw that there was a reduction when people did not know the race of the families and the children, suggesting that many social workers, much like many educators, may make decisions about how they respond, how they treat, how they connect, how they communicate with families through this racial prism. So to give a little bit more black background about the, the blind removal process, I think it's important to know that what Dr. Price says is that what happens is that you have a committee of child well professionals with them being to determine if a child or children should be removed from the family based off of some allegation. What makes it blind removal is that the caseworker who already has seen the family, like I mentioned, and made an initial assessment of risk will present the facts of the case, but never mentions the demographics or the neighborhood. So no mention of zip code, no mention of family names, no mention of family race or ethnicity. Just look at the facts. And all, identif all identifiable information on, on the case is removed and the discussion focuses on what has occurred, relevant history and family capacity and strength. And after the presentation of the case, the committee makes a recommendation regarding whether the child should be removed from the family. So there you have in a nutshell, line removal. And part of what Dr. Price has found is that when this was done, Black children were far less likely to be taken from their homes, far more likely to receive appropriate supports, far more likely to, to receive appropriate services, which means that in many cases, when you don't have to think about race, it can work to the, to the advantage of children of color. We need to understand the same thing here in Los Angeles County and part of what we're doing, and again, I said, thanks to the Taylor's leadership, uh, a motion was passed just last week by the Board of Supervisors here in Los Angeles County to say, what if we were to pilot and look at a single office here in Los Angeles County to see if blind removal worked in Los Angeles? If we, if we, if we knew that, that there were committees who had to make decisions without knowing zip code, without knowing family background in terms of race or ethnicity, would that make a difference in terms of students, families, children not being in the, in the, in the welfare system? So we raise these questions because again, there's got to be a different way we think through these topics as it pertains to equity, access, and opportunity. Uh, 
But then I think we have to also do something that Kimberly Crenshaw talks about. There's got to be an intersectional analysis of this as well, because it's not only issues of race that matter. And one of the areas where schools fall short, and I maintain that in the child welfare system, we fall short as well, is where you begin to look at the intersection between race and gender identity or sexual orientation, where we know Black students have high rates of engagement in some of our carceral systems and child welfare. The same thing is said for our LGBTQ plus youth. And when you begin to put the, the intersection together of youth of color who are also queer, and then we start to see all kinds of ways in which we see some of the most disenfranchised and oftentimes overlooked and underserved population. So we begin to look at the ways in which even when you look at LGBTQ plus youth across the board, that we see that white LGBTQ plus youth are not experiencing houselessness, incarceration, trafficking, or for that matter, engagement in the child welfare system at the rates of black LGBTQ plus youth. And same thing can be said for our Latinx queer youth, right? So we're raising these questions to begin to ask, how do we create more systems that can be, begin to call out issues of racism? How do we call out systems that seem to be steeped in homophobia and transphobia? And how do we call out these systems that continue to sort of dis miss the very groups who are the most vulnerable. So part of what we have to understand is that, that this also means we have to do some retraining or re-education, I should say, of our educators. And I raised that because there was a study that we did with the Center for the Transformation of Schools just two years ago where we looked at Black youth across LA County. And we looked at Black youth across LA County because we were concerned about the fact that the numbers of Black youth in the county are dwindling, they're, they're, they're decreasing, but yet the outcomes are, are getting worse in a lot of different categories. But part of what we cannot do is look at these groups in a monolith. And, and what we did was to say, who are the groups of students who are most vulnerable when it comes to black youth? And what we found, there was two groups that really stood out. They were black youth who were experiencing homelessness and black youth who were in foster care. And so just to give a little bit of background on the study, what we looked at was 14 different districts across LA County. These 14 districts had the highest rates of black students in them. We want to look at their outcomes. And you can look up the report if you wanna really kind of put yourself to sleep with a lot of boring data, but I think it's kind of interesting stuff because this is the stuff we do. Uh, there's the report is called Digging Deeper Beyond the Schoolhouse. And here's what we found is that when we looked at young uh, black youth who are in care and chronic absenteeism, um, and you see here on the chart, these are the 14 districts that we looked at. The county rate for youth who are in care is about 14%. Uh, in terms of absenteeism rate, right? But you see here, these data point, some, point to some very deeply disturbing rates that we see that youth, Black youth who were in care had chronic absenteeism rates that were in many cases two, uh, in some cases almost uh, three times higher than the county average. Places like Pasadena, that Black youth in care had a, almost a 50% absenteeism rate. Places like the Antelope Valley, even Centinella Valley absenteeism of youth and care have significantly higher rates. So this begs the question, and this is where we're doing some future research. What explains this? If youth are in care and they're supposed to be getting additional types of supports and resources and services, why do we continue to see just access to schooling important? That's why Jill is gonna be talking in a moment because she's much more well-versed on the educational rights of youth and care than I am and can talk about you know students being able to stay in their school of choice, uh, it, it requires a lot of navigation to make sure that students are able to uh, access the school once they've been taken from their primary uh, place of residence, placed into a, into a, into a foster uh, situation. So issues around absenteeism are real. When students are missing school, they miss out on quality instructional hours and instructional time. And part of what we know is that the data tells us that for students who miss 10 days, I'm sorry, 10% of the school year, that's, 100, that's 18 um, days. 10% of the school year, the likelihood that those students will be on target uh, to, 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 to transition from one grade to the next are reduced significantly. So when you look at those data I showed you at the outset about the number of young people who are not graduating from high school, one has to at least ask the question, uh, is this issue here around chronic absenteeism around black youth tied to that? Then we also looked at foster care youth, black foster care youth and suspensions. Now, suspensions are a topic that have been talked about ad nauseum in, in a lot of educational spaces. The, the, you see on the far right, the total county rate for youth who are suspended, who are in care is about 2%. But if you look at these, these districts here, again, it begs some deeply disturbing questions, right? Why is that black youth who are in care uh, have a suspension rate of 30% or, or in Pasadena or in uh, Centinella Valley? 
Uh, part of what we maintain is that when there are not the proper kinds of supports that are put in place for youth in care, uh, you're likely to see different kinds of behaviors that get phrased or get situated and seen as being problematic, difficult, disruptive, uh, and that becomes part of not what is wrong with students. Young people grow frustrated. Young people can grow depressed. Young people can grow uh, in a lot of ways around sort of the emotional health and well-being when they find themselves in care. So again, we're again, we're talking about chronic absenteeism. We're talking about suspensions. Uh, these are all ways that we take young people out of opportunities to learn. Uh, missing instructional time, missing opportunities to learn and grow academically, connecting with peers, connecting with teachers, meeting with counselors, things that should be happening within the school context. But when young people are not there, it doesn't bode well. And for Black youth in care in particular, it's even more challenging. So we're engaging in some research now. We're talking, we want and we're trying to see if we can get you know, approval to talk to Black youth who are in care or former Black youth who are in care to talk about their experiences, where schools could have been more supportive, where schools could have been better, where schools missed the mark. Uh, because again, there's this correlation between child welfare and education that it needs to be talked about much more explicitly so we can understand how these systems can support one another and not in, in many ways sort of work against one another. So I raise these data because now what we will see happening is that we found in our report uh, with the new uh, federal COVID relief funds that districts across the entire country are going to be receiving a lot of money, lots of money. And we looked at the 14 districts that, we're, that we studied to see what kind of funding relief they have coming their way. And what we found is that California has billions of dollars that it will see over the next year tied to federal uh, COVID relief funds. And you see here on the far right in the yellow corner, uh, the kind of resources that school districts are going to be receiving. LA Unified alone will receive close to five, almost $5 billion. Uh, and so part of what we are asking is how can we begin to help schools do better by supporting their most vulnerable populations? And as I mentioned, the most vulnerable populations are oftentimes uh, black and brown youth, but black and brown youth who are in care uh, and our black and brown youth who are members of the LGBTQ plus community. So, We've oftentimes heard this argument that, you know, we can't, we need to do more for, for our most vulnerable population, but we don't have the money. We don't have the funding. Well, for at least the next 12 months, that will not be the case. And so the question we're asking districts is, how can you make your spending transparent? How can you show where funding will be allocated? How can you ensure from an equity standpoint, and I would argue from a moral standpoint, that your most vulnerable populations, you will put the, a need, the, the necessary supports in place to ensure that they're not going without the needs that they have, that you're engaging family members, caregivers, you're looking for community-based organizations that can help to partner with you. Because the argument that we make in this report is that schools cannot go about it alone, but schools have to know and understand the needs of their most vulnerable populations if they're going to be able to support and serve them. So again, we know that the children like to are overrepresented in these different systems, uh, more likely to be removed from their homes, uh, less likely to be reunified with their birth family after removal, and more likely to stay in foster care longer than other children. So we have to begin to sort of, again, ask these hard questions to remove these barriers. And I think other questions that we need to think about for consideration is how are resources being spent currently for youth and care? Uh, because what we are finding that it leaves a lot to be desired, and Jill can probably speak to this more than I can about sort of if we are allocating funding in the right, appropriate, and equitable ways, and how do we make sure that the most pressing educational needs for youth and care are, are going to be prioritized? And where can schools play a better role? How can we help train, retrain, uh, reteach, reach, uh, re, uh, reteach our teachers and our administrators and counselors so they're not quick to think of those good parenting, good student, good behavior models as these sort of ways in which we see certain kids being labeled as being difficult, defiant, disrespectful, or perhaps subjected to abuse and neglect when that may not be the case. And then the final question we have to continue to ask is what role, if any, does race play for youth in care? And that's what we're hoping to find out with our study. Lots of questions, lots of questions. We need answers um, because I think that we have to understand how these systems, as I said a moment ago, um, oftentimes fall short and they fall short amongst the very population that we say we want to care more about. I always think about education. Horace Mann talked about education being the proverbial equalizer. Well, in many instances now, when we look at what should be happening, in many ways, we see schools not being the equalizer, but the, the, the disequalizer, meaning creating or contributing to greater gaps. And that's where we've got to be better. That's where we need to do more. I will stop right there and see if I can pass it off to my comrade in struggle, Jill Rowland. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Amazing as always. Uh, so my name is Jill Rowland. I'm the director of the education program at the Alliance for Children's Rights. Um, the Alliance is a nonprofit legal services organization serving youth in out-of-home care, primarily kids in foster care, but also kids in the juvenile justice system and kids transitioning um, out of those systems as they get older. Uh, we provide a variety of free legal services um, to those children and their family to increase their stability. I think you're going to be hearing from one of my awesome colleagues, Cynthia Billy, on Thursday talking about our adoptions program. Um, we also work with um, families that there are no allegations of abuse or neglect, but you do have a child living with someone who is not their biological parent for whatever reason. Um, and we help finalize um, guardianships for them through the probate court um, to help keep those families stable and to give that caregiver legal rights over that child um, to make all types of different decisions. Um, we also provide education advocacy. You're going to learn a little bit about that today from me, um, as well as advocating for those kids to access the health, mental health, financial benefits, um, and other services that they need to be stable in their home. Um, and then we also work with youth who are transitioning out of that system. Um, they face many barriers um, that we wanna help them overcome as they're moving into young adulthood. Um, sometimes, although not often, and without the support of their family members. So after all of that, um, let's talk about education. So <clears throat> kids in the foster care system, <clears throat> excuse me, kids in the foster care system um, in general, face a variety of issues that we're going to talk about today um, that contribute to the lower education outcomes um, that Dr. Howard was speaking about. Um, those issues include um, kids in the child welfare system are primarily children of color, um, and so we have a lot of race, class, and other intersectional barriers um, that may make accessing a high quality and equitable education difficult for them. Kids in foster care because of the abuse and neglect they potentially have suffered in their biological home or or and or um, as a product of being in the system and being moved from home to home that creates trauma as well. Um, that makes it very difficult for them to learn. Um, and because of the instability um, and going between multiple different schools, um, that disrupts um, their education as well as their social and emotional connections to their peers and to adults on campus, making learning more difficult for them as well. So those are some of the barriers um, very quickly um, to how um, kids in the foster care and juvenile justice system um, struggle to access their education and to access a high quality e uh, equitable education. Um, but what I'm going to spend the most of my time on today is talking about the different laws and protections that are in place to protect those children's rights um, and the rights of their education rights holders. Um, I will just make a, a note. Um, there was a study done recently in LA County that talked about the fact that of all of the children in the juvenile justice system in LA County, about 80% of those kids had ch uh, prior um, interaction with the child welfare system. So when I think about foster and juvenile justice youth, I think they are the same youth and the same families who are struggling. Um, so I may say foster care a lot as a shortcut, but I'm always mean foster and juvenile justice youth. Um, all of the laws and rights that I'm going to talk about today apply to them both equally. All right, so I'm going to have two tools um, that I'm going to use today um, that Taylor has and she will share with you. Um, so don't feel like you need to copy down all the information that I say. I'm going to show you where it is um, in these tools and toolkits that I'm going to share with you and you will have access to them. So the first tool I'm going to share with you is our Foster Youth Education Toolkit. Um, and this toolkit focuses on the general education rights of children in care. So they don't have to have a disability. They don't have to have any type of special need. Um, kids in care just have to have an open foster care or probation case um, to qualify for um, the special rights that I'm going to talk about. 
Now this toolkit was specifically designed for school districts to give them the tools to better meet the legal needs and rights of kids in care. Um, so I just wanna give you that framework so you know who this is designed to cover. Um, so if we look at the table of contents, I'm not going to go through everything here. We're just going to touch on a few different things. Um, I will touch first on education rights holders. We'll do a bit about enrolling, including immediate enrollment and school of origin. Um, there are pieces in here on trauma, um, discipline, and early education. Those are topics that I'm not going to cover in great length today, but the information is here. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the high school rights of kids in foster care. Dr. Uh, Howard did a great job talking about the differences in um, graduation rates that our kids face. Um, and so instability is one of the things that leads to that. So we're going to talk about partial credits and the special graduation rights of youth in foster care that are specifically designed to attempt to combat that. So. The background here is that in 2004, so that would be, I don't know, 17 years ago, California passed some really um, kind of breakthrough or groundbreaking laws to protect kids in foster care because we knew that their education outcomes historically have been very poor. The problem with those laws are, even though they've been in place for this many years, um, school districts just did not have the tools to understand them, to implement them, et cetera. And so um, we built this toolkit to give school districts those tools. So the first topic we're gonna talk about um, is school of origin. So I mentioned earlier that kids in foster care are often moved from home to home. Um, on average, um, kids in care attend about eight different schools while they are in care, losing up to four to even to six months of their learning with every single move. So I don't know about all of you, um, but in my life, I went to one elementary school, one middle school, and one high school. I was very lucky and privileged to have that type of stability. Um, so kids in care, again, on average, have those three schools plus eight more. Um, if anybody in um, our audience today has ever experienced a school change outside of the normal elementary to middle transition or middle to high school transition, you can probably reflect back on, you know, how difficult that school change might have been. It might have happened in the middle of the school year. You might have had to lo uh, leave some friends behind. You probably have to figure out a new camp, how to navigate a new campus. You probably had to make new friends, make new connections with teachers. If you played sports or participated in any type of like visual performing art, you probably had to like re-enter those scenes. Um, and all of that would have been very difficult. Um, now, imagine doing that without your family there to support you. Imagine doing that on your own, without your parents, potentially without your siblings. Um, and you can only imagine how difficult that would be. Now imagine doing that seven more times. So just to give you a little bit of kind of the situation that our kids are facing and how difficult it can be for them. Um, I use that little factual hypothetical um, to try to get us there. So, um, because of that, there are specific laws passed to try to keep kids more stable in school, and those are the rights called school of origin. So the law says foster youth have a right to remain in their school of origin if it is in their best interest as determined by their ed rights holder. So what this means is typically you go to school where you live. But if your home placement changes and you are a foster or probation youth, you have a right to stay at your old school, even if you've moved to a new neighborhood, across the county, across county lines, et cetera. And the idea here is we want to keep kids stable in school. Hopefully they have, you know, a support system there that even if they're losing their home, we can keep them stable. <clears throat> now, another <clears throat> important point here is who decides whether or not remaining in their school of origin is in their best interest. Well, for kids in the system, they have what's called an education rights holder. Now in a typical family, um, a biological parent holds the education rights for the child in their, um, that for their child. Um, but for kids in the system who have potentially been removed from their parents um, and their parents' rights may or may not have been um, terminated or limited, 
um, courts um, are responsible for identifying is a biological parent able to retain education rights, be involved in the child's education and make education decisions? And if not, then finding and legally appointing someone else to hold those education rights and make those education decisions. Um, so here, um, it's important to note that it's not up to the school whether or not the child remains in their school of origin. It is up to the child's court appointed ed rights holder um, to make the decision about what is in the child's best interests. Um, there are a couple of different options for school of origin for kids. Um, the situation I just gave you where a child moves homes but stays in the same school, um, that is one option. And we also look at school of origin as whatever school the child attended when they were first placed in the foster care or probation systems. Um, and that could be a while ago. Um, so for example, if a child was removed in the third grade and now they're in middle school, they're obviously not gonna go back to the elementary school that they came from. That would not be age appropriate for them. But they do have what are called feeder pattern or matriculation rights. So if their peer group from that elementary school moved into a specific middle school, they would have a right to go to that middle school. And the idea there is we're keeping that peer group the same or returning them to their original peer group. Hopefully they might have some friends and connections there and can find some stability. Also, a school of origin is defined as any school where the youth attended in the last 15 months where the youth feels a connection. And I think that's really important. That's not mediated by what the school thinks or what the ed rights holder thinks. It's where the youth feels a connection. And this is one of the very small number of places in our system um, where we are kind of highly valuing um, how youth are interpreting their experience. Um, school of origin applies to all schools. That includes magnet schools and charter schools. Um, the right to school of origin, um, uh, if your court case closes in middle, elementary or middle school, um, kids have a right to stay in their school of origin and finish out the entire school year. Um, but if you are in high school, even if you're on the very first day of ninth grade and your court case closes, um, those kids have a right to stay in that school of origin all the way through graduation. So again, one of these places where we're trying to create um, increased stability for kids in high school to help promote their graduation. The biggest issue in school of origin is about getting kids to their school of origin, who's going to drive them back and forth. Um, and there are a couple of options there. Um, first of all, caregivers can receive mileage reimbursement um, for driving kids back and forth to their school of origin. Um, and this link right here gives like the amount of money you get um, based on how many miles. Um, there is also a rideshare plan in LA County that most districts have signed on to. It's kind of like Uber for kids. It's called Hop Skip Ride. Um, and kids can get access to that through working with their school district um, and their uh, social worker to, um, um, to get access to that. Sorry, just checking the chat box to see if we have any questions coming in. And I don't see any. So I'm gonna keep moving. You guys probably noticed um, I am a quick talker. Um, so I will keep moving through the content, but I have no problem at any point if anyone wants to unmute themselves and chime in or throw a question in the chat box. I'm always happy to take those questions. All right, so if a child in foster care or in the probation system, um, if their ed rights holder decides that it is not in their best interest to remain in their school of origin, they do have the right to immediately enroll in their new local school based on their residence. Again, this is an ed rights holder decision um, about what is in their best interest. School of origin is supposed to be the default, but if that's not in their best interest, then they immediately enroll in their new school. Um, it is important to note that kids very often are not immediately enrolled, and that can be caused by, you know, schools saying, you know, you've got to go over here or fill out this paperwork online or come back on Tuesday between 9 and 9.03 because that's when we enroll kids. Um, so there's lots of barriers to getting kids immediately enrolled. Um, we also have kids living in group homes or what they're now called short-term residential treatment programs or STRTPs for short. Um, we often have those um, housing um, agencies not enroll kids um, immediately. They might, you know, 
say they want to stabilize them based on like a mental health need or something like that. Um, so, you know, there are lots of reasons why kids are not immediately enrolled. Um, so good. We have just, I'm going to pause on the immediate enrollment and go back to school of origin. We had a great question. What about schools of origin that require extra tuition? Would that continue to be paid for? So I do want to make clear school of origin applies to public schools. Um, so again, you know, you don't pay for your school district. You don't pay for a charter school, um, school of origin, um, would not apply to something like a parochial or religious school where you have to pay tuition. Um, that does not count. There are special ed schools um, called non-public schools um, where a school district is paying the tuition. And those do count as schools of origin and the school district would continue to pay that tuition. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered the question, um, but that is the best answer I've got for that. All right, so back to immediate enrollment. Um, kids have a right to enroll in the same or equivalent classes as those they took at their old school, even if they're transferring mid-semester. So this is really important for kids in high school. You know, if you're moving in the middle of the semester, it's really unhelpful if you're taking, you know, two credits of biology and then all of a sudden you're in two credits of um, earth science, right? Those are not the same courses. They don't add up to a full credits worth of, a full semester's worth of credit. Um, and so um, this enrollment in the same or equivalent classes is a really important one. Um, kids also have a right to equal participation in extracurricular activities, regardless of tryout or sign up deadlines. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you have a right to be on the football team if you come in the middle of the season, but you do have a right to try out. And if you're as good as all the other students, you have an equal right to participate um, there as well. Another thing that we see happen quite often um, is that kids in foster care are often enrolled in continuation or all other alternative um, education programs like adult school or independent study. Um, that is not allowed, um, especially by someone enrolling them who's not their ed rights holder. So a situation we very often see group homes or SDRTPs enroll all of their kids at the continuation school because it's easier for them to just take all their kids there. Um, that is illegal. Um, kids can be enrolled in alternative education programs if their ed rights holder decides it is in their best interest. Um, but kids can't, you know, a lot of what we hear is like, oh, I went to go enroll in high school and they told me I was credit deficient, so I had to go to the alternative school. Or they told me I had bad grades, um, so I had to go over there. That type of school push out, um, which does disproportionately impact children of color as well as children in the foster and uh, juvenile justice system, that type of um, of uh, school push out is 80 gold. <clears throat> All right, so now I am gonna move on to the high school rights um, of kids in foster care, um, but I will pause and answer a question first. So how are education rights holders chosen? Really good question. So education rights um, are required to be addressed in every court report by the social worker or probation officer. So they are responsible for saying like the kid has an ed rights holder, they don't have an ed rights holder. If they do have an ed rights holder, are they involved in the child's life? Or was it like five foster parents ago? Um, and then the judge has a responsibility at every court hearing, they happen about every six months, to make sure that there's an ed rights holder and if there isn't one to appoint someone new but who decides who that person should be. Typically the social worker should be making a recommendation. Um, so they might say like, okay, well, the kid is now in a new home and this new person is a relative and we hope this is gonna be a permanent placement for that child. So we're recommending that the caregiver slash relative be pointed education rights holder. Uh, <clears throat> there are other situations in which the caregiver is not appropriate. Um, and that may be if it's just you know, going to be a temporary placement while the child is moved somewhere else. Um, we also have kids, again, in those group home or SDRTP settings. Um, those people cannot hold education rights. Um, and so for, for those people, you might be looking at um, volunteers or CASAs, court appointed special advocates. Um, it's important to note that relatives, caregivers, uh, biological parents, or other adults, 
um, in the child's life that are involved in their education can all be ed rights holders. Social workers cannot, probation officers cannot, group home staff cannot, and school staff cannot. So anybody with a potential conflict of interest cannot be an ed rights holder by law. Again, that's social workers, probation officers, um, attorneys representing the kids who are getting attorney's fees for their work, um, group home staff, and school staff. <clears throat> But it's always going to be a really individualized um, kind of analysis about who are the adults in the child's life, who is engaged in the child's education, who will make good education decisions for that child. All right, so let's talk about partial credit. So when kids in the foster care system transfer mid-semester, they have a right to receive the credit that they earned from both of their schools. And that is proportional based on what is in the law called seat time. Um, so if they went to one school for, let's say, the first half of the semester um, and they passed their classes, they would have a right to have somewhere around, let's say, two and a half credits per class. And then if they go to the second school in that same semester, that second school also has to award them grades um, and a proportional number of credits. It's in my example, say about two and a half credits. And then hopefully they're enrolled in the same or equivalent classes. So you're able to put the two and a half credits of algebra with, together with two and a half credits of algebra. You have a full five credits of algebra. That's a full semester's worth. And that child is chugging along towards graduation, which is the whole point here. The idea of partial credits really is just to give kids credit for the work they actually completed. We get a lot of questions about like, well, what if they do, didn't do any work? Well, if they didn't do any work, they got an F. So five credits of an F does nothing for them. <laughs> if they did a little bit of work, but not a lot, and they got a D, they get five credits of a D, just like any other kid who went to school who didn't do a whole lot of work, but did a little bit, got enough to get a D and passed. So it's just about treating kids equitably as all other kids kids are treated. Um, there is no specific calculation for the state. The legal responsibility is for each school district to have their own policy for awarding partial credits. Um, we, um, in this tool, created a model policy, which awards about a half a credit for every seven class periods attended. Lots of districts have adopted this model policy, but not all of them, some of them um, choose a different calculation. It's important to note that um, kids cannot have their grades discounted based on attendance at court or other court ordered activities. So even though there's technically, typically about 90 school days in the school year, you'll see here that if kids go to 70 days, they can get their full five credits. And that's to allow for absences caused by normal illnesses, um, absences caused by court, attending court and court or activities, or absences caused by delays in enrollment. We wanna give that flexibility there. So that's the partial credit model policy. Um, so then finally, um, kids in foster care or on probation do have special graduation rights. Those were put in place under um, law, a law in California. The original law was Assembly Bill 167, um, a supplementary law that made modifications to it was Assembly Bill 216, often called AB 167216, or the graduation exemption. And basically what this law says is if a youth transfers high schools after completing their second year, so you can think about in their junior or 11th grade year, um, and because of the transfer, they cannot reasonably complete the local district requirements within four years of high school. So example here is they transfer into a school that requires four years of a foreign language and they've never taken a foreign language before and they're in their junior year. There's going to be no way to do four years of a foreign language there. If they are in that situation, we then waive the school district requirements and the student can graduate using the state minimum requirements. So typically state minimum is 130 credits. It's the it's specific credits. So it's not just any 130, it's three years of English and history, two years of math and science, et cetera. Um, but school districts typically require about 220 or 240 credits. Um, a lot of those are kind of extra add-on elective credits, which are very important. Um, but if we need to waive those to allow our kids in care to graduate on time within four years, um, this option is available to them. 
like with everything else we've talked about so far, it is up to a youth education rights holder to determine um, whether or not using this graduation exemption is in the youth's best interest. Um, so that is important as well. Um, kids who move schools have a right to be notified of their eligibility for this within 30 days of the move. Um, so that's important as well. And this law does apply to all schools run by school districts, including alternative schools like adult um, education schools um, and continuation schools, et cetera. So that is what I'm going to cover in relationship to the general education rights of youth in the system. Um, I am gonna turn now to talk about special education rights. Um, I will also just share with you um, the kind of all the rights that I just talked about, school of origin, immediate enrollment, partial credits, and AB 167216 graduation, all of those rights apply to a, an entire set of highly mobile student populations. And those include foster kids, kids in the juvenile justice system, students that are homeless, students from military or migrant families, as well as newcomer students. So all of that entire set of um, rights and protections applies to all of those highly mobile student populations. All right, so now we're gonna talk about special ed. Um, and the reason why we kind of talk about and focus on special ed um, is because kids in the foster care system for a variety of reasons typically have a higher incidence of disability than kids in the typical population. Um, there are different studies in California and across the state, but I would say about 15% of typical population have disabilities. And in the foster care and juvenile justice system, that ranges anywhere from 50 all the way up in the juvenile justice system to like 75% of kids have um, learning or mental health or behavioral disabilities. Um, and the reasons for that are many, and I'll touch on just a few. Firstly, as we know, kids in the system potentially have been um, subject to abuse and neglect and experience trauma and or they are traumatized by being in the system itself. Um, that creates lots of different types of mental health, social, emotional and behavioral disabilities. Um, also, kids that are in the system um, have potentially a higher um exposure to drugs and alcohol in utero that causes different disabilities, including kind of really typical ones like ADHD um, or, you know, lots of other types of disabilities as well. Um, I also think there is something to be said. Um, right now I am in North Idaho. I'm helping to care um, for my niece and my nephew. My nephew um, is immunocompromised um, and he has a disorder that affects his behavior. And I will just speak from personal experience, um, parenting or co-parenting in my case, um, special needs children is extremely, extremely difficult and requires every single skill I possibly possess. Um, my nephew's mom is actually also a trauma therapist. So between the two of us, we have all kinds of skills, um, but it is still extremely, extremely hard. Um, and, you know, I never really understood the exasperation, frustration, being at your wit's end um, to care um, for a child like that. Um, and so I think that that can create the situation um, in which abuse can be more possible as well. So there's lots of reasons why our incidence of disability um, is higher um, in the system. So um, just to show you the table of contents really quickly here, we're not gonna go over all the content, um, but there is more on education rights um, for anyone who has um, interest in that. Um, there is also, um, a, so what we are gonna talk about today is the special education system. So for kids from three years old, all the way to high school graduation, um, or aging out at 21 or 22, um, there are a set of rules and laws that apply to those kids and school districts are responsible for meeting the needs of those children. There is another system that we're not gonna talk about today, which is early intervention. And that is for kids birth to three who have developmental delays. So let's say for example, they're not walking or talking how they should for their age. 
those kids potentially have a right to early intervention services. <clears throat> and those services are provided through the regional center. And then at age three, kids transfer from the regional center over to the school district. I'm not gonna talk about the early intervention rights, but I wanna point out um, that there is information there for people who are interested. So let's move on to the school district system. Um, and one of the things that we are going to talk about today is kind of how does all this kind of play into the COVID world and being in school and out of school and remote, et cetera. Um, so I am going to touch on that as well and certainly welcome any questions you all might have um, about those topics. So let's start with the legal duty. School districts have an affirmative duty to identify, locate, evaluate, and then serve children who have disabilities who are residing within the school district's boundaries. And this is called our child find duty. The idea is you have to go find, identify, locate, evaluate, and serve those kids. Um, this is a pretty low threshold um, and it does impose a significant duty on the school district um, to identify these kids. So this means, you know, a kid is sitting in a classroom and is failing. But this also can mean, you know, kids three to five who are not in school, maybe not in preschool, um, but maybe they're seeing their doctor and their parent is reporting or their caregiver is reporting a speech delay or a behavioral issue. Um, school districts are supposed to be kind of finding and serving those kids as well. So the first thing to do for these kids is to request an assessment for them. Um, and the district has a duty to assess all kids with a suspected disability. And that's a really low bar. Um, lots of our kids in the child welfare system already have diagnosed disabilities, which means they clearly meet and exceed uh, the bar for getting an assessment. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna be eligible for special ed services. It just means that they have a right to an assessment to see if they are eligible. Um, there's lots of other things that can kind of meet that low bar, the suspected disability um, standard. Um, that could be something as simple as failing in school. It can include social emotional behavioral concerns. So the kid is inattentive and is not doing well in school. The kid is having social issues and is not doing well in school because of it. Maybe they're getting in trouble on the playground, et cetera. Um, all of those reasons um, are reasons why a child might have a suspected disability. Uh, the first step is to put your request to the school district. You know, as a lawyer, um, I always talk about documenting everything in writing so you can prove it. So we strongly recommend that requests are put in writing. Um, we actually have, um, when you get the tool, you can click on this link right here and it will take you to an actual document that you can you know, type into or print out and write on um, that is a special education assessment request. Um, the school district, once you send that to the school, the school district has 15 calendar days, um, so that includes weekends, um, to respond to that request. But those, those, uh, that timeline only runs during the school year um, and does not run during school breaks that are longer than five days. So it doesn't run over the summer. It typically doesn't run over winter break because that can be anywhere from two to three weeks. Um, uh, typically would run over Thanksgiving or over spring break because those are only five days long. Uh, the school district only has two legal options in terms of responding to the assessment request. They can either grant the assessment um, in writing. And what they do is they provide what's called an assessment plan that says, okay, we agree to your assessment. Here's the different areas we're going to assess. Here's who's going to do the assessment. And the ed rights holder then reviews that, signs that, returns it to the school. Or they can refuse to assess in writing. And the in writing part is really important. We have a lot of verbal refusals and those are all illegal. So why don't we talk, oh, I hear your concern, but your kid's doing okay. I don't think we need to do an assessment. That's illegal. Um, why don't we talk about that at parent conferences? That's illegal. Um, well, we're gonna have an, a student study team meeting in a month. Why don't we talk about it then? That's illegal because that's outside of the 15 day response timeline. Um, so any verbal response um, is not an appropriate legal response. And the reason why I harp on this quite a bit is because um, 
one of the easiest things that caregivers and ed rights holders can do is to know the law and know their rights. Um, and because the suspected disability um, hurdle is such a low one and it's so easy to get over it, um, if someone knows what their rights are and says, well, I understand that you're telling me verbally that you don't want to do it, but I know I have the right to get that response in writing, so I'll just wait for you to send me a letter. Um, once they are forced to put it in writing, um, it's harder to deny the request. So knowing that you have that right to that written response, insisting that you get it in writing, um, in many instances, not all, but in many instances actually pushes the school district to just go ahead and grant the request. Um, so that is a really good kind of advocacy tip. Um, so the common assessment that most kids receive is called a psychoeducational assessment. Um, and that assessment looks at like, what is the child's capability of learning in terms of retention and memory and processing? How do they take in information visually and auditory and make sense of it? Um, they look at where's the child doing academically and they do all this through standardized testing. So it isn't like, did you get a B on your report card? But I'm going to give you, you know, a paper and pencil test and I'm going to compare your scores to kids all across the nation and we're going to see how do you stack up. Are you doing kind of the same as everybody else? Are you doing significantly higher or significantly lower? They also will do a little bit of work um, assessment around social, emotional, and behavioral needs, um, as well as do kind of a vision and hearing screening. And that assessment really works for a lot of kids. But there are other kids who have very special identified needs that might need specialized assessments. Um, so if you're working with a child whose language is not developing appropriately, there's a special assessment for that. Um, there are also special in-depth assessments for kids who have auditory or visual processing issues. Um, we also have occupational therapy assessments that can be for kids who are having problems with the fine motor muscles in their hands. So that might be implicated in, for example, handwriting. Um, there's also assessments for kids with severe mental health or behavioral needs as well. Um, so that's really important. Um, once a ed rights holder signs an assessment plan and sends that back to the school, the school district has 60 calendar days, six zero, to do all of the testing and convene what's called an individualized education program or IEP for short. And IEP meaning to review the results, determine eligibility, et cetera. So I'm gonna pause, take a quick breath. Um, but what I'm also really going to do is talk about, so what happens with all this in the middle of COVID? Um, so we're going to talk both about what the law requires, and then we're going to talk about, like, in practicality, what has happened. So the law on requesting assessments, which is that initial 15-day timeline, you request an assessment, they have to respond within 15 days. That timeline was waived, meaning the school districts did not have to respond to those requests, but it was only waived from March of 2020 to June of 2020. That's a very short window in which school districts were not required to respond to those assessment requests. After June of 2020, school districts absolutely still had to respond within the 15-day timeline. And a response of, Yes, we will assess you after we go back to school in person it is not a legal response. The response is either granting the assessment, giving you an assessment plan and moving it forward, or refusing the assessment for the sole reason that the child was not demonstrating a suspected disability. So any COVID related excuse for denying an assessment was illegal. In addition to that, the 60 day timeline from when the assessment plan is signed to return to the school and they have to do all the testing and hold the IEP, that timeline was never waived. So if a child was in the middle of a 60 day assessment when COVID hit in March, they still had a right to have their assessment completed and their IEP held within 60 days of that returning that signed assessment plan. And that has never been waived at all. So now that I've shared with you what was supposed to happen, let's talk about what actually happened. Um, pretty much every school district stopped assessing every kid um, March through June. In kind of June and over the summer, um, 
the test manufacturers and publishers. So there's a lot of different standardized testing that occurs. Um, and that testing has to be administered in a very prescribed way. So if you guys think back to like, I don't know, whatever the last test you might've taken is, maybe it was the SAT or the GRE, or even just tests you might've taken um, when you were in K-12 education, you probably remember you had a proctor and the proctor had to like read some very specific instructions. And then they had a specific timer for how long you had for that section. There are similar kind of rules around how you have to administer special ed tests, what you're allowed to say and not allowed to say, the timing of it, et cetera. And that's what standardizes the test is because you give the test to hundreds of thousands of kids all across the US and you're able to compare the scores because the test is administered in exactly the same way. So the publishers of the test came out, not all of them, but for quite a bit of them and said, okay, we have now tested remote administration of our tests and we've now standardized them, meaning that you can give these tests remotely, AKA over Zoom or computer or whatever, and they are still valid and reliable. And so because of that, any kind of practical reasoning of why a school district couldn't test kids remotely kind of disappeared. So in the fall of 2020, assessments should have started up again. Um, and in some cases they did. Um, in September, um, the state released what I call for short, the small cohort guidance. And that kind of controlled for all of last school year. And what that said was you can bring kids back in groups of no larger than 14 and you can bring them back in the classroom. And so some school districts use that to bring kids back into school. Um, other districts use that to bring in kids one-on-one -on -one to do testing in person, um, and other districts chose to do some testing remotely. But I would say by and far, most districts did not do special ed testing for most of last year, and this definitely includes LAUSD. Um, we filed, I don't even know, 20 or 30 different complaints against LAUSD with the state, and some of our kids were ordered to have their testing completed and we did get some kids tested, but by and large, I would say in general, we have from March of 2020 until today, so about a year and a half, um, we have a, an entire set of kids who did not get their special ed tests. And that is really significantly problematic. You know, if a child had a learning disability and they were struggling in school before the pandemic, you got to know that was significantly exacerbated and made much, much worse by remote learning. We also have a lot of kids who had already gone through trauma and experienced kind of depression and social anxiety or isolation um, because they had been ripped apart from their family. And then they're kind of isolated in a, a strange new home and kept away from school. So we had lots of kind of uptick in the social, emotional and behavioral needs of our kids that was actually caused by the pandemic or caused, caused by the isolation of the pandemic or caused by the struggles of the pandemic, right? So we know that so many of our families experienced higher rates of housing instability, employment instability, food instability, and all the stress that that brings um, upon children and families. And that can really exacerbate or create, um, you know, additional needs for kids. So we have all these kids that are extra, extra struggling in school and extra, extra struggling socially, emotionally, and behaviorally, yet they don't have access to special ed testing, which means they then don't have access to special ed services. So even though these rights have been in place and even though kids had a right to continue to access um, their assessments in order to get eligible, in order to get services, many, many, many kids did not. And there's a huge backlog of assessments and services um, assessments to get eligibility for services for kids. So I don't know what is going to happen in the fall, but it's going to be chaos. Um, and it's not going to be pretty. So I will take a breath here. Any questions on the assessment process? I'm going to talk in a little bit about what is an IP and how do you get eligible and what the services are, et cetera. But any questions about the assessment process? I do real quick, Jill. 
Yeah. Can you talk about the fact that here in Los Angeles County, at last check, we have over a hundred plus some odd languages that are spoken. Are there are are there legal considerations that that assessments have to be in a child's native language? That is such a great question. So yes. Um, a child has to be assessed in what is called in special ed their primary mode of communication. And that includes either any of the foreign languages they might speak. Um, it also includes, for example, um, children who use American Sign Language or, uh, you know, other forms of communication. Um, some kids with disabilities actually have no language at all. And so they might communicate through technology. Um, so that's that primary mode of communication is meant to be as broad as possible. Um, and kind of a corollary to that, um, in the IEP universe where we have IEP meetings, um, IEPs have to be translated into the parent's primary mode of uh, communication as well. Um, so great question. Thanks for asking. So let me, let me add one more piece. And if I'm, if I'm getting ahead of myself, just tell me to be quiet and you'll cover <laughs> it. So, so, so that issue just around primary mode of communication. Oftentimes, and I'm glad you mentioned that you have filed complaints against LAUSD, but oftentimes schools are not in compliance and schools are not, uh, uh, they're not in, in ordinate, they're not in line with the law. But I get concerned, you get concerned, many other people get concerned about the fact that you may have immigrant families who, from a cultural standpoint, are not really of the mindset that you question the school or that you don't challenge the school's decisions or you don't really you know, ask questions. And so many kids who are among, again, are most vulnerable just don't have the kind of advocacy. I mean, you're, you all do phenomenal work, but what about those families and children who don't have the people who can sit in on IP, who can ask those questions about assessment? What happens there? Yeah. Um, you know, the stuff of my nightmares. <laughs> you know, I think the reality is that <clears throat> LUSD and many other districts are wildly out of compliant, even in a pre-COVID world. Um, there are lots of special ed violations that occur all over the place. And then you add the pandemic in and it gets even worse. And I think that the, the barriers to access fall along class lines, race lines, you know, linguistic lines, et cetera, um, citizenship um, status. And so, yes, I, you know, we certainly hear from many of our clients. You know, we have a lot of clients, especially in the Latinx community who come to us when their children are older and who say to us, like, I had faith in the education system, you know, where I'm from, where I was raised, we were taught to, um, you know, respect those systems. And so I respected them and I told me my child didn't need this and I listened to that for years and years and years and now I just I can't listen to that anymore I have to fight for my child I know that they are struggling and I need to help them so I think that those things are real um yeah. you know how to overcome Not having the language by being worried about your immigration status being reported um to you know, not wanting to question authority, you know, I don't have solutions to that. There are procedural protections in place. So one of the things I just talked about was filing a complaint against a school district. There are complaints that can be filed with the State Department of Education. Um, you know, if the 15 day timeline is violated, if the 60 day timeline is violated, um, we'll talk a little bit about like, did kids actually get their IEP services during COVID? If a child is not getting their IEP services, you can file a complaint on that. Um, but I will say we've been getting some mixed results out of the California Department of Ed. Um, you know, some of our kids have had their assessments and services ordered and other kids have lost their complaints for kind of an un un understandable kind of inconceivable reasons. Um, and so it's, it's not a perfect system. And, you know, this is why we talk about what people's rights are and encourage people to reach out for help to us or to any of the other agencies that provide these services for free. Um, but there is a, you know, cultural language citizenship barrier that our clients report to us that they had to overcome sometimes to get to us. Um, that is real. And I, and I don't, <clears throat> I don't know what the the solution to overcoming that barrier is. Yeah. Yeah, it's complicated. It is. I think you have a question there, Cicely. I do. 
Okay, so is there any prohibition against having teachers assist parents with making their assessment requests? Um, and the answer to this is no, there is no legal barrier or prohibition. Um, and actually teachers are allowed to refer kids for a special ed assessment all on their own, um, even without the parent. So that's the law. Let's also deal in practicalities. Um, I think that teachers potentially will be frowned upon by their school district or by their principal or by their administration um, if they are referring a bunch of kids for special ed testing. Um, we are kind of work in this zero sum game in education where there's only so much money to go around. Although these days that pot is a lot larger than it's ever been. Um, and it's a, it's a battle over resources. And so, you know, yes, teachers supporting parents and making those requests, I wholeheartedly, you know, rah, rah cheer for that. Um, but I would be thoughtful and practical about how you do that. Um, I am a bucker of the system. Um, but you know, for those of us who play that role, you know, we do so at our own peril. And I think we need to be aware of that and, and take on those risks willingly. Great question. Thank you. Um, okay, another really good question. So is there a concern for overdiagnosis due to racial bias for special ed assessments? I've read about disproportionate diagnoses, but I'm wondering if I'm thinking wrong to apply that to this situation. So yes, absolutely. There's both over and under representation. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a pin in that question for just like 20 seconds and we're going to come right back to it. So let's talk about what are the components of an IEP. Um, so um, in an IEP, you have five main components. You have eligibility, which is, are you eligible? And this is where over and under representation come in. And we're gonna talk about that more in a minute. You also have present levels of performance. So how is the child performing right now? You then have to set goals for where do we want the child to be in a year so that we can measure their progress. And then you have what placement and services are you going to give to the child to help them meet their goals and make the progress. So let's talk about eligibility and about over and under representation. So there's a whole nother training that we give um, that kind of focuses on this topic that I will not be able to go into in great depth, um, but I want to give you kind of the basics of this. So how do, how do I try to put this somewhat simply? Um, there is definitely research that demonstrates that kids of certain colors um, are over and underrepresented um, based on what is seen as the kind of objective versus subjective components of different eligibility categories. So I'll give you some examples here. So um, there was a lawsuit against LAUSD in 1980 brought by a little boy. His name was Larry and his last name started with a P. So his name's Larry P. So the lawsuit is Larry P versus LAUSD. And that lawsuit alleged, and Larry was um, a young, I think he was like five or six, a young um, African-American boy. Um, and so his lawsuit said, LAUSD, the IQ tests that you are using are, rac are not racially and culturally normed. And so you're asking a bunch of, you know, inner city kids of color about sailboats and parabolas, something they've never been exposed to. And because they don't know the answers to those questions, you are then finding that they are mentally retarded. And I use that term because that is the term um, from that lawsuit. Um, the current term that we use is intellectually disabled. And that lawsuit found um, that that was illegal, that you cannot use um, IQ tests that are not culturally and racially normed um, because it you know, disproportionately found particularly young men who are African-American as having uh, mental retardation. So that's one example. Um, another example, and that is something that was thought to be standardized. Um, and, you know, it was thought that, you know, IQ doesn't change, you know, your, your IQ that you have is what you are born with. Um, we now know that that is not true. Um, IQ is impacted quite a bit by exposure um, to different things, including early education um, and lots of culturally enriching um, activities. Um, 
they have worked, I think test publishers have worked hard um, to find assessments or to create assessments that are that are culturally and racially normed. Um, although, you know, are we to where we need to be? I think that still remains in question. Another example I will provide you <clears throat> has to do with, I'm gonna use two categories and kind of put them in juxtaposition to each other. So the category of emotional disturbance um, is really kind of a horrible name, um, but covers some really important categories for kids. So kids who experience depression, anxiety, um, social issues with peers and adults, um, or kids who have um, emotional or behavioral issues that are kind of outside of the norm. Um, all of those kids can fall into a, an emotional disturbance category. Um, you know, things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, oppositional defiance disorder, um, all those can fall into ED. You will have a different category called other health impaired. <clears throat> And other health impairment requires that you have a chronic or acute health issue that negatively impacts your ability to access your education. Lots of kids typically with an ADHD diagnosis will fall under other health impaired, but you can also use a depression or anxiety or a PTSD diagnosis there as well. What they found is <clears throat> that, especially for boys, um, so boys, when they are suffering from depression or PTSD, often present as inattentive, just because that's a more socially gender constructed presentation. Whereas a girl, as a socially constructed gender presentation, might express her depression through, for example, crying or kind of sh outwardly showing it. Um, that is not socially acceptable for males. And so they may just be kind of distracted and their thoughts are elsewhere, et cetera. And so what we see happen is that um, particularly African-American males are significantly overrepresented in the emotional disturbance category and white males are overrepresented in the other health impairment category, even though they may both be presenting kind of similar inattentive, impulsive type behaviors. Um, so that is one thing that we find it's also really interesting. Um, so things like autism um, or traumatic brain injury, you have an underrepresentation of children of color, um, which is a really interesting um, kind of factor um, in our specific learning disabled or specific language impairment. So learning disabled means that you're having problems academically because your brain is not processing information correctly. And speech and language just means that you have a, a a uh, delay in your ability to acquire and use language in an age appropriate way, either through pronouncing your sounds or through like having appropriate vocabulary and word choice and word usage. Um, those are seem to be what I might call, um, what's the best way to describe this? Like there's no negative connotation in that. Like there is an intellectual disability or emotional disturbance. They're kind of seen as like kind of cleaner or pure, um, you know, kind of no fault of the kid's own type of a thing. And you definitely see um, white children overrepresented in those categories as well. So we see these really interesting kind of configuration of both over and under representation um, of white kids and kids of color um, I will also say that this, the, the trends that we see with African-American and Latinx kids, we also see with indigenous um, students and some of the trends that we see with white students, we also see um, repeated in our Asian and Pacific Islander communities. Um, and so there's just some interesting differences there. Um, we could talk about that for hours, um, but I think I will pause there and see if there are any specific questions or comments from anyone. Okay. So Jill, um, can I jump in yes. here? Because, yes. okay, so this gets into the bias piece yes. all over again, right? And I oftentimes get asked by administrators, so then what do we do? How do, how do, we, how do we unlearn bias? Any recommendations, suggestions there? Yeah, I think that there is deeper work to be done from a social science perspective and looking at the, the assessment tools that are used. Um, and looking at the standardization and the norming. Um, so I think that's one piece of it. I think the other piece of it that like we definitely see. So when I read a special ed assessment, I kind of cheat and work backwards. 
So when most people read an assessment, they kind of read what, you know, for example, the school psychologist has written and they kind of go along with the recommendations of the school psychologist. I flip to the back and look at all the scores and do like an independent analysis of the scores and see what the scores tell me. Um, and then I go back and look and see like what the school district assessor wrote. And it's kind of shocking how often the scores and like the findings don't line up. So for example, to be, to be a student with a learning disability, you have to have a certain standard score difference between your cognitive score and your academic score. And that's really prescribed by the law. You have to have 23 standard score point difference between the two. And so like that's either there in the numbers or it's not there in the numbers, but I can't tell you how many kids like had a learning, dis you know, kids of color had a learning disability yet you know, the assessor is recommending that they be emotionally disturbed. So I think you can find some of the bias there by trying to kind of look at the numbers. Um, I also think there is a significant amount of historical and structural bias baked into our education system and implicit bias in all of the actors in our education system. Cause we all, I think probably everyone here knows we all have implicit biases. The more we are aware of them, the more we can specifically try to counteract them but we all have them, including me. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we as advocates do is try to think about how do you approach and address biases that are coming out in these assessments in a way that is both authentic to the people it impacts, our clients and their families, but also is productive um, in terms of, you know, and I, you know, I've been in a situation where I basically said somebody was being racist and they like screamed and cried and left the room and then the IP meeting was over and I couldn't get anything for my client right so it's like kind of balancing that 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 advocacy space in between um that that is really difficult but also really authentic and true to to the client and their experience um so none of those are perfect answers but that's that's where I'm struggling with yeah but no I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that let's just kind of identify the elephant in the room which is that structural historical bias and racism, classism are real, and that people think that they are not, which is a fallacy in my humble opinion. And I think just starting to at least acknowledge that we all have it to some degree is huge. And I'm glad you pointed out these objective versus subjective categories and how we see overrepresentation when the, the subjective elements are left to, to the individuals to kind of make their own inferences. Yeah. And I put objective in quotes as well, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, because yeah. historically we know that they've not always been objective either. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mm -hmm. have a hundred percent faith that they are a hundred percent objective now either. Um, you know, these are created by people. And so they are subject to, to problems. Mm -hmm. um, great. I love that digression. Um, <laughs> I will say for all of you, um, we actually have a four hour training that we're obviously not delivering today around um, the historical and structural kind of racism and classism in our education system that goes into many of these topics, including implicit bias, you know, much more deeply. Um, so that's certainly something, and it's a brand new training. We just developed it and began delivering it in the last, um, you know, six months to a year. So, you know, that's something that if people are interested in, we can talk about that. Okay. We have another question. Um, can the new funding, and I'm assuming this is going to be our kind of COVID funding, create stronger systems of accountability and enforcement and what might that look like? So that's a really there are, are good, but difficult question. First um, that I am struggling with yeah, right now. You know. um, and so there's a couple of things. So with these new kind of billions of dollars, um, they are supposed to be kind of accounted for in what's called a learning um, continuity plan, which is different than California's current funding system, which is um, uh, the LCAV, which is, um, oh my gosh, I'm totally going to brain fart this. Sorry, guys. Um, it's gone. It's absolutely gone out of my head. Anyways, we have an existing funding plan called an LCAP um, that is written every three years and updated every year and is supposed to have a community stakeholder component. And then we have the learning continuity plan that was new last year and will continue this year, but then after that I think will go away. Part of the problem with these new funds is they are what are called one-time funds. So 
you know, if you are given a million dollars, you might think like, okay, our kids are suffering socially, emotionally. I want to hire a bunch of new counselors and have them serve kids. But districts, I think, are somewhat leery to do that because they're going to have to fire all those people in a year because the money's going to run out. So this one-time funding piece of it is difficult. I will also say that the kind of account of the stakeholder engagement and accountability pieces and the learning continuity plan are not very strong, um, which makes it makes them, I think, less responsive to local community needs. Now, I think that some districts are going to do amazing things with that money, um, but there are there are places that I think are more concerning. So just to give you an example, one of the things that a lot of this money is supposed to be for um, is to assess learning loss and then address learning loss. But I haven't heard any district talking about how they're assessing it. You know, are you going to give kids a test and see who's behind a full year and then give those kids extra services? I'm not saying that's the right way to do it, but that is a way to assess learning loss and to target services. And I just really haven't heard a whole lot of anything about that. Um, so I think it remains to be seen. I think that there is a lot of potential for that. Um, but I am scared that the money's not going to go directly to kids. Um, so, you know, I have some fears about that as well. Um, so we had a question about what if they are higher functioning? I'm assuming that question was in relationship to a specific conversation. Um, so Monique, if you want to just give me a little bit more detail or context, um, I will definitely come back and try to answer that. Um, the process you use to detect bias sounds empowering. Do you have a cheat sheet for teachers on this process you use? If so, I want it. Um, so in terms of bias, I think that the best place to start is the Harvard Implicit Association Test. Um, it's free and you can Google it. Again, it's the Harvard As Implicit Association Test. Um, and this is the place where, and there's all, like there's uh, like 20 or 30 different um, tests that you can use um, to identify your own bias. And I think I've taken pretty much all of them. Um, I think what's really important that I have learned about bias is that we all have it. We've all been raised in our culture and in our society. And this bias is in the media, it's in the books we read, it's in our institutions, it's in our you know structures, it's in our history, it's everywhere. And you've got to be, I don't know, dead to like pretend that it doesn't influence you. It influences all of us. Um, but the more you are aware of what your potential biases are, I think the more that you can um, kind of address them. A really good book on this subject that I absolutely love is called Unbiased. Um, and it's, oh, it's by a psychologist. I think her first name is Jennifer. I can't remember her last name right off the top of my head. Um, but it is a really great one that talks about the circumstances in which bias comes out more and what you can do. And a lot of it is actually self-care, creating room, creating space, making sure you're not tired, et cetera, that helps you, um, helps you identify and kind of prevent biases when they're coming into decision making. Um, are there resources showing how autism, TBI, et cetera, can show up differently for students of color? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know of any specific research and others might um, about how autism and TBIs present differently for children of color. Um, and I'm sure that that is playing into it, but, but a lot of what I think is happening is that, um, thank you so much, Dr. Howard. Um, so he gave, um, the link to the book that I was talking about. Um, I think what is happening a lot with autism and TBIs is that we're looking at behavior and as assessors, we are putting it into a category. And so, a behavior that could look autistic or be an autistic-like characteristic could also be looked at as more um, uh, volitional. 
and could put you more into an emotional disturbance category. So, you know, I'm having a tantrum because I'm not sensory processing well, and I don't have the language to tell you what I need, AKA autism versus I'm having a tantrum because you're not giving me a cookie, AKA I'm a bad actor, AKA emotional disturbance. Um, so that's what I see a lot of how we're, um, placing kids based on kind of our socio-culturally, racially referenced standards of behavior and saying this is an acceptable behavior or this is a disability defined behavior versus this is a volitional bad actor um, type of behavior. Um, but I would not doubt that there are not some great resources out there about how autism or TBI, et cetera, could show up differently for students of color. I just don't have my hands on them and cannot give them to you. So I'm so sorry. Um, okay. How do you detect biases in the IEP like the score discrepancies? So, so this relates back. Sorry, I'm just trying to follow the chain here. All right, so Cicely or Monique, please just unmute yourself and tell me your question because I'm having problems following and I, I wanna answer it if I can. This is Cicely speaking. So yeah, I had asked the questions because you described your process as, as you're sitting in IEPs and you you know, will go flip to the back and look at the scores and then come back to the diagnosis. Um, so I was curious about that process if you have like a you know, sort of cheat sheet thing, because you mentioned it should be a certain threshold of score. Got it. That sort of thing. So I just wonder where can I find that information? Because I'm often in IEPs and would love to have that as a resource. Great. So, and I actually have an answer for that. <laughs> um, okay. So one of our tools, our eligibility checklist, which links right here, um, is a cheat sheet on what are the different um, tools um, and what are the different scores to meet all of the eligibilities? Now, it doesn't cover all of them, but it does cover specific learning disability, speech and language impairment, emotional disability, autism, and other health impairment. Um, and the eligibility checklist tells you a little bit about how to read standardized testing. Um, and then it goes through those um, categories that I just called out and tells you what the legal categories and requirements are. So that's number one, you can read up on that. Secondly, I think one of the best things that you can do um, is get a copy of the report. Um, we asked for it five business days, so a full week before the IEP. Um, and we won't go to an IEP until we have the report in hand. And we spend a lot of time reading the report, analyzing it, looking at our eligibility checklist, speaking with our family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and kind of really understanding what's happening before you walk in the meeting. I will say it's pretty much impossible to get a 30 page report in the middle of a meeting and then try to participate in the meeting and read the report and make it all make sense at the same time. I think that's one of the ways our IEP system makes meaningful parental participation impossible. Um, so that would be kind of an advocacy tip that I would highly recommend. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we've got just about 10 minutes left. I just wanna kind of zoom a little, I think these have been really good, meaningful, time sensitive and appropriate conversations, but I wanna give you guys just a little bit of the rest of the overview of the IEP process. So you have that. Um, so once you go to your initial IEP, your child is hopefully determined eligible. Um, after that, you create an IEP for them, which covers um, what they are entitled to receive to access and benefit from their education based on their disability. Um, and then after that, you have an IEP at a minimum once every year. Um, kids have to be tested at a minimum once every three years, but they can be tested more often. Um, and then parents or ed rights holders can request an IEP at any time if they think the child is not receiving their IEP services um, or if they don't think what is in the IEP is appropriate and they want to ask for something different. So let's talk about the additional components of the IEP. So present levels of performance are kind of exactly what is going on with the child now, and we want them to be very specific and comprehensive. So, you know, Johnny doesn't know how to read is not very helpful. Johnny, who's in the third grade, is reading at the first grade level, is measurable and specific and tells us what we need to know to get him where we want him to get. 
So that's an example of a present level performance. Um, an annual goal is from a year from today, we want Johnny, who if you recall is in the third grade and reading at the first grade level, we want Johnny to be reading by the second grade level or by the third grade level, whichever kind of standard you wanna set. <clears throat> Goals are one of the things that are kind of the most annoying thing to do at an IEP meeting because you have to like sit there and struggle and make them measurable and make sure that they're going far enough. Um, but I will actually kind of strongly recommend that if you're going to an IEP for a child that you actually spend a decent amount of time on goals because goals are what get you services. So you only get services as necessary to meet your goals. So if you're trying to get a service in a certain area, you might gotta make sure you have goals in a certain area. And goals are actually what we use year by year to measure progress. And if a child is not meeting their goals, um, you can use that to argue for more services. Um, so goals can be really important for that re reason as well. Um, and at the bottom of this page, there is this whole chart of potential areas you could have goals and this is not exhaustive, um, but it's just some examples. So um, once you figure out all the areas of need in your present levels, you set goals for the child to improve in those areas in your annual goals and objectives, you then get to provide the placement and services necessary to help the child meet those goals. Um, in terms of placement, um, our mandate here is the least restrictive environment. So we want kids in the least restrictive environment possible, but that still allows them to access their education. Every child's least restrictive environment is unique to them based on their disability and their needs. Um, the special ed law was passed kind of in the wake of the civil rights movement. And so this least restrictive environment a mandate comes from this idea of segregation and we don't want to segregate kids based on color and we certainly don't want to segregate them <coughs> based on their disability either. Um, although there is a very specific history um, of segregating kids by calling them segregating kids of color by putting a disability label on them um, and that actually allowed a lot of schools to quote unquote, desegregate, but still have segregated classrooms and tracks within schools. Um, so just want to highlight that for everybody. Um, but um, in terms of our um, different types of classrooms possible, you have gen ed, which I think everyone is probably familiar with. On the other side, you have a special day class, which is only special ed kids with a special ed teacher, typically a smaller number of students and the curriculum moves much more slowly. In the middle, you have what's called resource specialist program um, where kids might be in gen ed for a majority of the day, but receive, you know, for example, pull out maybe an hour a day support in reading. Um, you can also have what's called RSP push in where someone goes into the classroom. So for example, the teacher gives the lesson and then the student needs the information repeated and needs help filling out, let's say, for example, the worksheet. Someone could push into that classroom, pull the student to the back of the class after the major lesson has um, been reviewed um, and repeat the lesson and help them with their worksheet as well. Um, there are things called non-public schools for kids who are unable to access their education in a public school setting, a non-public school um is an option um funded by a school district it is only for special ed kids typically very specialized placement um as with everything there are good ones and bad ones so you know just getting a non-public school is not going to necessarily be a magic bullet um and then you have a variety of services that kids may be entitled to based on their specific needs from speech and language therapy occupational therapy counseling, uh, mental health services, one-to-one -one aid, special ed summer school, assistive technology, you know, kind of et cetera, et cetera. Um, another really important piece um, is the moment of IEP consent. Um, ed rights holders have to sign the IEP to put it into effect. Um, and this is a place where you can kind of treat it like a menu and say, I like this service, but I don't like that service. You can also say, I like that service, but I want more of it. So I'm agreeing to it, but only to implement it. I disagree that it's what my kid actually needs. Um, this is another really important moment in terms of if you have a service at an IEP and a school district wants to take it away, 
um, if you have it in an IEP from earlier that the ed rights holder has signed, um, they cannot change it or take it away unless the ed rights holder agrees in writing. This is what we call kind of colloquially the stay put right. You have a right to stay put in your service or your placement until you agree in writing otherwise. So this is a, a, a power moment. Um, where again, if districts are trying to take something away, parents can say no, not agree and not sign. Um, so really quickly, um, you know, when schools closed down in March of 2020, I think we all know kind of everyone stopped receiving their, their education at least for a couple of weeks. At some point after that, you know, schools started to you know, use Zoom and have classrooms, uh, but those were maybe only happening an hour or two a week compared to a six hour school day. Um, I think things got better for the 2021 school year, especially because we had a new law in place, SB 98, which required, I think, you know, depending on the child's age, a minimum of three to four hours of instruction per day. Um, but some of that instruction could be synchronous, meaning kind of live instruction, and other pieces of that instruction was allowed to be asynchronous. So think, read on your own, do a worksheet on your own, watch a video on your own. I don't call that much of teaching. Um, and in the midst of all of that going on, um, kids with IEPs very significantly um, were not getting all of their IEP services. Um, they were not getting all of their therapies. They were not getting all of their academic instruction required by their RSP hours or their SDC minutes. Um, and so there were very significant IEP violations um, that were absolutely ongoing throughout the entire pandemic. You know, I have a little bit of faith that schools are gonna reopen um, in the next month or so. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know if it's actually going to happen. I think it is really important for kids to get back in person. Um, you know, I think kids have compensatory services claims based on all the services they didn't get in their IEP for the last year and a half. Um, and it's a complicated, messy situation. You know, we have to balance safety needs of everybody involved with the absolutely essential right that kids have in California. It's in our constitution. Our kids have a right to receive an education. Um, so it is messy and difficult, um, but you know, I am somewhat hopeful that things will be better in the year to come. No promises or guarantees. Um, and with that, I know uh, Brittany and Taylor have some business for you all. So thank you for being a great audience, asking great questions. Um, I will put our website and my email in the chat. Um, so anyone feel free to reach out to me at any time with any questions.